The agenda is uh, a certain report um, that needs to be given by Islamic education. If you remember the last Executive Council meeting, we had been asked by the Executive Council meeting to look into uh, certain comments, certain ideologies uh, from a particular scholar. It had been brought up quite vociferously at the Executive Council. And the Executive Council asked the Secretariat, obviously made up of Islamic education, to look into this matter. Now, let me be very clear. Whilst there may be many people around the table who feel we have taken some time on this work, it actually is a sensitive and complicated topic. It requires toing and froing, it requires academic discussion, and it requires cooperation. Uh, and so therefore, it has taken some time for us to get to where we are. I'm going to ask Sheikh al Dina to give his open status report on this. He will present it. Um, I think Sheikh Muhammad Ali as well, I think the two of them are presenting it. And then I will allow uh, some discussion on this with a view to uh, a direction forward. Whenever we discuss sensitive topics, the top table and the chair, and I'm chairing this on behalf of the, the president, just conducting it on his behalf, always asks for decorum, um, looking at things with reasoning, uh, and looking at things with a cool and sound mind for the betterment of the community. We've had an excellent day, I feel. I think we've done a lot of good work. Um, we've had some very positive debates. We haven't shied away from any, any debates. And I hope in this topic uh, we will do the same. So I will allow Sheikh Alina, please, to join the, at the front uh, and to give this. Uh, I would like you to give him your undivided attention. Uh, and then we will take the agenda, uh, this part of the agenda, uh, forward as well. So please, can I ask you all to welcome him with a loud salawat? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, on which page is this agenda? Of the PEC? It's part of the Secretariat agenda item. Islamic education is on from page 42 onwards. Yeah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa Ali Hitahirin Respected elders, counselors, Pramukh uh, Sahib, the OBs, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Secretariat had asked the Islamic Education to look into this issue which had presented itself around this time last year, November 2017, uh, October, November 2017. If you recall, around the time of Arba'een, a clip began to be circulated in the social media uh, regarding Arba'in being a, a carnival and there was pressure on the World Federation to respond to such statements being made by one of the well-known speakers and scholars of the community. In response, the World Federation issued a, a statement whereby we explained the position of all the top marja beat in Najaf, be it in Qom, regarding the validity and the recommendation of the whole process of uh, procession of Arba'in. Subsequent to that, around November 2017, other video clips began to be circulated and they were brought to our attention and community members began to apply pressure that what is the World Federation going to do to such uh, statements. So around 20 or so clips were 
sent to us, forwarded to us by different community members. And uh, it was decided in the first trip that in the company of uh, the President Anurabai Dharamsi uh, that we made to London, we should go and meet the respected Sheikh uh, Arif Abdul Hussein in Birmingham to uh, seek uh, clarification about these uh, clips. About 20 or so clips, 10 were on the subject of fiqh, 10, the other 10 were different topics about gender equality, about sectarian issues, about Shia theology, about history, and about uh, religious uh, pluralism. So we had a meeting, uh, myself, the IE team, uh, my colleague, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Ismail, in the, in the company of uh, the uh, Honorable uh, Secretary General. We met and uh, accompanied also by Maulana Sahib, uh, Sheikh um, Zafar Abbas Sahib. And in Birmingham, we met the respected Sheikh uh, uh, Arif with his uh, a trustee from the Al Mahdi Institute. Unfortunately, what had happened during this time period was we were not aware, but Dr. Akbar Ali, when we met him in London, he brought to our attention that there seems to be some negative impression about us uh, and our interaction with Sheikh Arif, some expected sort of banning fatwa or something like that would be issued and we said that no, uh, that is not the purpose of this visit and meeting. The guidance we take is from the Holy Quran. Many a times you receive news, you s receive reports, statements, quotations, but uh, which may be out of context, which may be improperly understood or misinterpreted. So it is our duty before we make any decision to seek clarification, to to verify, to confirm the authenticity of what is being stated. So we explained to the Honorable Sheikh that we've come here with three purposes. Number one is to seek confirmation that these 20 or so clips that are in circulation, do you confirm that they are your statements? And number two, we want clarification about what you meant by these statements because the impression out there is negative. And um, if necessary, any contextualization about this. And I quoted some hadith, the, I, I quoted the four, uh, the four finger test that we have. The four finger test is the difference between truth and falsehood is the four fingers between the, the ears and the eyes. Many times you hear things, but they could be misinterpreted, misquoted, so you have to be able to see for yourself and verify for yourself what is true and what is false. And we explained to the Sheikh that we've come here for this, this purpose. Um, so the process was that uh, for ease of discussion, um, those 20 clips, we managed to get transcripts written down and uh, we shared one set of the transcripts with the respected Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, he quickly went through the transcripts of the 20 clips and he, he commented that I must commend whoever has transcribed that he has done a good job, this is authentic, these are my statements. So we got the confirmation to start with. So the next step was to seek clarification and contextualization. Um, Unfortunately, we did not uh, organize and categorize the transcripts into particular themes or topics or subjects. So it was just a random collection. And uh, so we just began reading one transcript and uh, sought his clarification. It just so happened that the uh, sc script that was chosen was about Arba'in. So the script went something like this, that Sheikh was saying that no Imam has grieved for Imam Hussein uh, for this whole long period of time. Um, so Sheikh explained to us what he meant was in Vancouver uh, in, in a question and answer session with some ladies, 
They asked him about marriage in other days of Muharram, in Safar, about buying house, about transactions. Um, so Sheikh said, originally the grief that we are supposed to uh, display is, is on one day. But unfortunately, the alims and the maulanas, they've extended from one day to 10 days, and then from 10 days onwards to 40 days. And so I said, excuse me, honorable Sheikh, but we do have hadith which says that come the beginning of Muharram, uh, Imam uh, Rida alayhi salam reports that my father, Imam Kadim alayhi salam, began to uh, experience grief and to show grief. So Sheikh said, yes, that hadith is true, but it's just telling us what the eighth Imam is reporting about the seventh Imam. It doesn't say the eighth Imam is also practicing that type of grief. And, uh, and he also explained even the intense grief displayed by the fourth holy Imam for all those months and years. None of the other Imams did it, he said. And he said, well, uh, grief, um, the fact that one Imam reports from the other Imam and he does not lay down any conditions would, would imply that there is validation of that particular practice of grief for a uh, prolonged period of time. But I didn't enter into more discussion because generally the fatwa of our maraja is that on the day of Ashura, it is makru, we have to avoid anything which is against the general ethos of grief that we feel on that day. Other than Ashura, to engage in other transactions so long as there's no celebration and there's no dismissal and, and disregard and disrespect for the Ahlul Bayt's time of grief, we can continue with our, our normal transactions. The transcript then continues and, uh, uh, and he says, so, so uh, the original grief should have been one day and not necessarily 10 days and up till 40 days. And 40 days, do you know Arba'in itself historically is uh, not authenticated? And I said, Sheikh, excuse me, what do you mean? And he says, well, you know, uh, great scholars like Ustad uh, Mutahari, they have said that there is no convincing evidence that the caravan uh, of the captives the, of the Ahlul Bayt salam, returned back from Sham to Karbala in the same year on the Arba'in. So I said, excuse me, Sheikh, but uh, are you aware that there are other scholars, there is other research which has been done where they have investigated historically how much time does it take to travel from Karbala to Kufa, how long did the caravan stay in Kufa, how long does it take to go to Sham, how long did they stay in Sham, and how long is it possible to take to come back to, uh, to Karbala from Sham, and it's very much possible, it happened in the same year, and there are some history books which do record it. And to his credit, Sheikh Arif said, I'm not aware of this alternative research. And he also said, but, but I am humble to the truth. If the evidence is presented, and if it is convincing, I will accept that. We said, Alhamdulillah, but the fact that you came to the member and you, and you spoke one side of it was unfair without investigating the other side. And the, the transcript then continues. So it was one day of grief and then the ulama said do it till 40 days and 40 days historically is not authentic. You, the problem is 80% of Shia faith is questionable. I said, oh, Sheikh, what do you mean by this? And he said, well, um, you know, there are many historical events that cannot be authenticated. And he said, majority of the Shia theology cannot be proven. And he said that there are assumptions being made about the Quran. The Quran is eternal. The Quran applies to all times. The literal meaning of the Quran. And uh, he says, well, to, to, according to me, this is not accurate. And uh, the fact that the Quran has answers to all questions, uh, I don't agree with that. And, and the theology that, uh, which is based on Imam he calls it the imam centricity and focus on the imams and, and the cursing of the khulafa and, and the shias do not give importance to the companions of the Prophet 
and the and the focus more on the Ahlul Bayt and less focus and in fact neglect of the Quran and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa and the exaggeration of the status of the Imams uh, the ilm ghayb that they have and 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 the uh, wilayat uh, and the wilayat taqwiniya they have and about salvation for other faiths um, and and then he mentioned some fiqhi fiqhi issues like multiple eids and three eids and and the uh, najasat of the mushriks and uh, and the issue of taqlid and ishtihad these were some of the issues that he raised to me, uh, I was not aware of his lectures, his statements. This was a whole new list of items. I had not heard about these. This was the first time I was hearing. So we noted the list. And uh, on some issues, for example, I uh, made a counter argument. I said, uh, because he quoted an ayah about, let's say, the ilm ghayb of the Prophet, um, that the Prophet refutes ilm ghayb from himself, he quoted an ayah of the Quran from Surah Mubarak Araf that "Law kuntu a'lamu al-ghayba, min al-khair." If I had known the ilm ghayb, then there are many good things and fortunes I could have amassed. And uh, so I said, "But Sheikh, excuse me, but there are other verses in the Quran. If this refutes ilm ghayb, there are other verses in the Quran which establish and certify." The Prophet did have ilm ghayb. For example, in Surah Mubarak Jinn, chapter 72, Allah says that Alimul Ghaybi La Yudhiru ala Ghaybihi Ahadan Illa Manir Tada Min Rasul. The absolute knower of all the ghayb is God and God alone. However, He does not display and demonstrate it to others except those whom he chooses and selects. So the Prophet could be chosen to be the recipient of ilm ghayb. And so the Shaykh said, yes, but those verses refute. And I said, well, these two verses need to be reconciled. And our ulama have worked on this, and they've offered a reconciliation. How is it that in one place, God says, you have no ilm ghayb. In another ayah, God says, you can have ilm ghayb when God grants it to you. And there are three, four, five different explanations of how this is possible. And the, the transcript then continues. And so 80% of Shia theology is under question. And he says, Mafatihul Jinan, 70% of it can be, um, if I remember the wordings correctly, it can be thrown out. And I said, oh, Sheikh, what do you mean by this? And he said, uh, do you know that Marhum Ayatollah Khoury Rahmatullah Alayhi, he said that this, when he was asked about Mafatih al Jinan, this, this Mafatih, uh, it is of the, of the Qummi. And I said, Excuse me, but I've never heard this. Who has asked this question? How was the question posed? What are the circumstances? I haven't seen this answer. In fact, we have seen other fatwas of Marhum Sayyid Khoury where he, he accepts what is there in, in Mafatih. He says, well, the Sheikh told me then, well, do you know that Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi, may Allah protect our Maraji, he has issued and compiled a new Mafatih al-Jinan. In Farsi, it is known as Mafatih al nuween So I said, yes, I'm aware of it. And so he says, but uh, so, so uh, uh, in this new Mafatih, I told him, as far as I know, most of the material of the original Mafati has been repeated. The only difference is the style, the language has been changed to modernize it, to simplify it, and to add some documentary evidence. So you'll get references in the footnotes of which dua and which ziyarat and which a'mal has been quoted by which uh, original hadith text source. So he tells me, all right, so uh, in this new Mafati, is dua in nudba in there? And I said, well, uh, to be honest, I'm still using the old one. But later on, I went and checked. Do I know dua is there in the new Mafatih? And he asked me several other du'as. Do I say fi sagheer and do I alqama? And I said, well, Sheikh, what seems to be the problem with these du'as? So he raised four issues. He said, number one, most of these du'as, their, their uh, authenticity is under question. The sanad is weak. And I said, well, Sheikh, even if the Sanad is weak, it doesn't mean necessarily that that Hadith is wrong. 
So, so if I can give in a, a layman's example to the audience here, uh, if, if we were waiting for the reporting of the sighting of the moon, we get two reporters, one who is a pious, reliable person, and the other one is, well, doesn't keep a beard, let's say. As far as the Sharia is concerned, the testimony of that reliable, pious person is going to be acceptable, and the testimony of the other um, person who is sinful will not be acceptable. But in reality, the moon could have actually been there, and the sinful person did see it. It's just that I have a credibility problem. So I need to look for secondary ways of trying to certify and verify. So I said, Sheikh, but even if the Sanad is da'if, but there are other ways of certifying the validity of that dua or ziyara. He says, well, the second objection is that the content of the dua and ziyara is questionable. So I said, for example, what? So he says, well, you know, in ziyara jamia kabira, there is a statement which says that, iyabul khalqi ilaykum wa hisabul khalqi alaykum, that on the day of judgment, the ma'asumin alayhim salam, Allah, uh, the creation will be referred to them and the creation's accounting will take place by the Masumin alayhim salam. So he tells me this is, this is something which is a divine task, not for, not for the creation. And I said, well, Shaykh, but do you know in the Quran there's an ayah in Surah Mubarakah, Ghashia, where Allah says, Thumma inna ilayna iyabahum. And on the day of judgment, the creation will return back to us, not to me, God says, not to me, to us, they will come back. And we, not me, not I, God says, we will do the accounting. In the tafsir of this ayah, there's a hadith of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, which says that on the day of judgment, وَكَّلَ subhanahu hisab al khalqi alayna. I read this hadith for him that Allah on the day of judgment will authorize the Ma'asumin alayhi salam to conduct the accounting of the creation. So Sheikh Arif tells me, yes, but this hadith is suspect. It is from the Ghali, the Ghulad, the extremists. And I said, excuse me, Sheikh, what is the definition of Ghulu? How, what is the criteria of accepting or rejecting who is a Ghali? And assuming that this, according to this chain of narrations, is by a Ghali, is there no other alternative secondary evidence to prove the veracity of the content of this particular hadith? And uh, the discussion continued, but then I think we had uh, requested for a time, certain time period, and Maulana Sahib, who was there in our presence, Zafar Abbas Sahib, said that I think we have had enough discussion on this on this transcript, let's uh, move on, there are 20 scripts. But time was short, so then we laid down the, uh, a process to be followed. The process would be that the remaining 19 transcripts, uh, Sheikh, uh, the respected Sheikh Arif would, uh, would give us clarification by correspondence, by email, with the London office through uh, my colleague, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Ismail. That was December. Um, subsequent to that, the whole of December passed and uh, we did not receive any uh, clarification. Um, so in January, the uh, the London Office Islamic Education, we send a reminder to Sheikh Arif that please, we await the clarification and the contextualization of the remaining uh, clips. So within five days in January, we received a reply from the Al-Mahdi Institute that sorry, Sheikh Arif is very busy, but he will try to answer in a reasonable time period, depending on his commitments. So January passes now. And uh, early February 2018, we receive a small email, uh, oh, sorry, one of the clips, uh, which was a clarification of one of the clips. One of the clips was about alcohol, that alcohol is not najis, it is tahir. This is what he stated on the member. And he said, you know, there are some 15 or so hadith which, which are sahih and authentic, which say that alcohol is tahir. 
And I said, respected Shaykh, but I have checked the sources of hadith, and they're not 15 hadith. And Shaykh uh, backtracks, and he says, well, okay, if it's not 15, uh, whatever number uh, there is. And I said, well, not all of those hadith are also which say that alcohol is tahir. Some say that alcohol is najis. So how do you reconcile these contradictory hadith? So in clarification, in the February uh, email that he sent to us, he quoted about five, six hadith from Tahzeeb al-Ahkam of Marhum Shaykh Tusi alayhi, that show that alcohol is tahir. And he also quotes Marhum Ayatollah Khoi that in his dars kharij he had said that the hadith which show that alcohol is tahir are more than the hadith which show that alcohol is najis. And the hadith which show about tahir are also authentic. And the quotation stops there. Now, alhamdulillah, we have in our presence some great scholars, uh, our Shahidi Sahib, Maulana uh, Shabir Maysami Sahib. Maulana Shabir Maysami Sahib, I was a little closer to him. I remember he has gotten his uh, ijtihad from uh, one of the scholars in Qom, Ayatollah Muhammad Hadi Ma'rifat. So uh, these great scholars, and Sheikh Muhammad Ali also has spent 10 years in Qom, we are aware of the process of ijtihad, how it happens or how it takes place. So it, all, all the top maraji regarding the purity or impurity of alcohol. The fatwa is alcohol is najis. Except for one. Hazrat Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi, may Allah protect our maraja, his fatwa is, it is najis but ihtiyat wajib. So amongst the top maraja, there is nobody, nobody who gives the fatwa that alcohol is tahir. Yet Shaykh is sending me only the hadith which shows that it is tahir. He's ignoring the hadith which, is, which says it is najis. And he's not telling us how his ijtihad is working to, to justify these two contradictory hadith. Marhum Ayatollah Khoi, if you go and check his discussion, he, he enters into deep juristic reasoning and he comes to the conclusion that despite the hadith which say it's pure, still the hadith which say are impure are to be given precedence and therefore the fatwa is that alcohol is najis. We were expecting to see some sort of ijtihad from Sheikh, but we did not see it. So this is February. Come the end of February in London we had an exco meeting and we were reprimanded. What is happening? How come no progress is made? So um, immediately after exco, within a couple of days, I think one or two days, we took an urgent appointment to visit Sheikh Arif once again in Birmingham. Unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know the London weather, unpredictable. We were told there's a beast from the east. And there was heavy snow. We couldn't travel to London. So we had a Skype call. We were in London. Sheikh, was, uh, Sheikh Arif was in Birmingham. But this time, I told my colleague, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Ismail, we are not going to engage in any discussion rebuttals, questions. We are just going to listen because we are under pressure from EXCO to be able to produce some sort of report and investigation about the status. If you're going to engage in discussion at this stage, we, the whole process is going to be delayed. So let's just listen for the clarifications and then we'll take the next step. So on the Skype call, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Ismail starts off by saying, Respect to Sheikh Arif, we are here only to listen for clarifications. And he gives his clarifications over the 19 scripts. Interestingly, now for the first time, we are being promised some strong academic juristic reasoning and proving and evidence. Wonderful. Ten academic papers were promised to us in that Skype call. And we said, Alhamdulillah, now at least we can start working. You, I can't go to, let's say, a marja and tell him, excuse me, you know, we have a great sheikh in our community who has a different fatwa from all the other marjas. He is saying alcohol is pure, for example. And all the top marajas are saying alcohol is najis. So they will say, aha, uh -huh. what is his evidence? And we say, excuse me, we don't know his evidence. He's just said it on the member that there are hadith which says that. It doesn't work. 
we need to see the detailed juristic reasoning. So we were very happy when we were promised 10 academic papers during that two and a half hour Skype call. So this is end February. March passes, there is no articles sent to us. Um, silence. So, uh, unfortunately, again, during this time period in March, we notice a strange thing happened. Al Mahdi Institute uploads the Skype call that we had with Sheikh Arif. Whereas it was never intended to be a debate or a discussion. It was intended purely to gather information. We were in the listening mode. Uh, so I don't know for what purpose it was put up. Unfortunately, it created a wrong impression in the community that uh, therefore we have no answers. The session where we did debate and discuss partially was the first meeting in Birmingham. In the second Skype call, we were quiet because now we were waiting for the evidence and then we were going to work on that. So the WF lodges a protest to Al Mahdi Institute that this is unfair, unethical practice that you put up on, you, you upload without consultation with us. And they apologize and after some period of time, I think is uh, offloaded. But unfortunately, somebody had already copied it, we are told, and some independent person, we are told, re-uploaded it again, so now it's available in the public domain. Meanwhile, we sat waiting, where is the evidence of the statements that Sheikh is making on the mimbar? So we started sending reminders, but there was silence. Um, incidentally, one or two articles were sent to us out of the 10 which were promised. And we were given links to their website, the uh, Al Mahdi Institute website. We visited it. The website contained more abstracts, not detailed papers. Abstract will just give you what is the question the paper is dealing with, what is the conclusion the paper has arrived at. Evidence is missing in the abstract. Evidence is in the detailed paper. That was the academic papers that we were waiting for, which we didn't get. We got one academic paper, the one on Rina. Around uh, uh, a few months later, we received a, uh, a message from the Al Mahdi Institute saying that there is a rumor floating around that Sheikh Ali Dina is complaining that um, uh, he hasn't heard from us after the Skype call. If you need any articles, please let us know. And we sent the list. We said, whatever you had promised in the Skype call, please. This is around uh, 19th September silence. 27 September, reminder, silence. 8th October, personally now, forget the email, the secretary, the project coordinator, she rings up AMI to ask, please, can I see the secretary of Sheikh Arif and I want to talk to him to get the articles. Oh, he's busy, he cannot respond. Next day after the call, on the 9th of October, we got three articles of the promised six or seven uh, articles. Now, time was running out. This is October. Sorry? Sheikh, with uh, Maghribain coming. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. it's okay. No, Sheikh, it's, it's, you know, we have, our full, undivided, we have our full undivided attention. Can okay. I suggest that we break the presentation into oh, two? Okay. So if you give a little bit more for the next, say, five minutes, okay. we'll break for Maghribain, okay. and then if you can then That's continue it, yeah. by right, summarizing right. and continuing. Okay, sure, sure. So, um, three articles were sent in October and six were still pending, academic articles. Um, meanwhile, of course, during, during the sessions that we met him both in December 2017 and February 2018, he did point out to us, how come you're coming to visit me and you don't, e have, you, have you listened to my lectures? Maybe you're taking these clips out of context. To his credit, we had not listened to the lectures. What was happening is we were under pressure. So many clips were in circulation. World Federation was being asked to respond. So we said, all right, let's go and meet the Sheikh with these clips. So we, need, we realized we needed to listen to all the lectures. The ones we could find online were Muharram 1436 in Los Angeles, Muharram 1437, Muharram 1438, Muharram 1439, and finally Muharram 1440 in Toronto. 
So we listened to all those five years. We extracted material from uh, those lectures. The few academic articles that he did forward to us, we extracted material from there. Um, and we prepared a dossier. But we had to stop. About six or so articles were still pending. The uh, secretariat, and now especially Pramukh Sahib, personally contacted me and he said, listen, time is running out. We can't wait any longer. You better close the file now. So October, we decided to close the file, the material that we had collected. We had collected material about his views regarding Aqaid, pluralism, about ilm ghaib about the infallibility of the masumin, about tawassul, about istiratha, about the Imam Mahdi, Ajalullah Faraja. Then there was some material uh, in the dossier regarding um, his views about the Quran, that the Quran is not eternal in its message. It, does, it cannot apply the same way that it was in its literal way during the Prophet's time. Um, and there were some history issues like Arba'een, like the Shahadat of Ali Asghar. It's not established, he says, historically. Uh, in the details that we hear from the member. Um, and then there was some, and the longest list in the dossier was the fiqhi masail. Almost about 20 different fiqhi issues were there. So we prepared the dossier, and the secretariat then sent a copy of that dossier to uh, Sheikh Arif. The reason was that we wanted to be fair, that in, in, in October, November 2017, we had heard others speaking about you. Now in October 2018, we personally have listened to your lectures, we have read your articles, and this is the summary of what we have understood. A 75, uh, 70 or so page document we prepared, a collection of all his views and opinions that we could pick up, and we sent it to him. I would like to pause here uh, by mentioning an ayah of the Qur'an, the guidance that we were following from the Qur'an. One of our great teachers in Qom, may Allah protect him, he says the Imam Sadiq salam teaches us that a scholar, before he makes a judgment, yes or no, he's got, he's got two barbed wires on his side, he can't cross. He can't accept anything to be true without evidence. On the contrary, he can reject something without evidence. And then Imam Ali Salam quotes uh, 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 ayah from the Quran to justify this, this uh, approach. So there's an ayah in Surah Mubarakah Yunus which says that Bal kazabu bima lam yuhitu bi ilmi. There were some people in the time of the past prophets who rejected what the prophet was saying but they did not have evidence for rejection allah is condemning this attitude if you reject something give us the proof on the other side if you accept something give us the proof alam yu'khadh mithaqullah an la yaqulu ala allah illa al-haqq has it not been taken as a covenant to be strictly followed by God on the people that they should not speak anything about God and attribute to God except that for which there is evidence. So to accept anything from Sheikh Arif, we had to look for the evidence. To reject anything about Sheikh Arif, we needed the evidence. So the whole process of visiting him, listening to him, asking for clarification, asking for the evidence, was guided by this overall principle, whereby any mujtahid you ask, and we have great scholars in our gathering, alhamdulillah, as counselors, they will tell you, any mujtahid issues any opinion or fatwa, you ask him and he'll give you the evidence based on the Quran, based on the hadith, based on the juristic opinions of the past, and based on other uh, supplementary evidence. Um, so we've reached the point now where the dossier has been sent to Sheikh Arif for his confirmation before we go to higher authorities to seek, to seek guidance. Now remember, uh, me and uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali, we're not claiming to be mujtahids. 
Um, and, and many of the issues Sheikh Arif was raising were ijtihadi issues. We types are there, eschatological, epistemological, sociological. I'm not going into the academic details. But in short, just to, just to impress upon you that this is not something new. For us, maybe since October 2017, it's something new. But in Iran, the scholars have already faced these issues 20 years ago. They were translated into Farsi and the academicians have been engaging with the issue of pluralism in Iran. And I met one of those scholars. I said, I'm sorry, I'm still in the process of preparing the details of all the thinking about this pluralistic thinking that is there in our community. I would like to come and visit you and get guidance. And he told me, listen, the father of the thought of pluralism in Christian, in Christian doctrines, the Hicks was a priest and then he converted and he said, no, Salvation is not only for Christians, salvation is for all other faiths. He came to Iran, he was invited for some conference. There's a whole research center that does research in theology. Hicks was invited to this center and Hicks was presented with arguments and this scholar tells me Hicks had no answer to the issue of pluralism. So that's an example. Another example, the issue of uh, the Quran's uh, historicity Technically, when you say the Quran only applies to, to, to the Prophet's time, some of the verses don't apply today. Technically, it is known as the historicity of the Quran. The Quran is a historic document. It was the historical, social, political, economic circumstances in 7th century, century Arabia, which shaped and governed the type of verses that we see. Historicity has been, again, it's an issue that has been raised in Iran theological circles. It has been debated, discussed, and responded to effectively. The issue of uh, Arba'in, I already uh, mentioned to you, historically, there are two versions. Some historians say it did not happen in the same year that the caravan came back. Some historians with credible proof are saying, no, it did, the caravan did come back. And, uh, and the other issues, fiqh masail. Um, Sheikh Arif is very, was very vocal, very vocal to say about Hilal. This issue of having three Eids in, in London, uh, the solution to that is having one global Eid. And he told us that he has evidence from Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, hadith after hadith after hadith that shows that you should have one global Eid. And we said, Sheikh, give us the proof. Which hadith? What hadith? Where? That article came to us very recently in October. And I had a quick look at it. And Hazrat Ayatla Sistani, may Allah protect our marajin. I'm sure many people from the West visit him and ask him about the Hilal issue. Hazrat Ayatla Sistani's fatwa is different from his teacher, Marhum Ayatollah Khoi. Marhum Ayatollah Khoi believes in a global Eid. Anywhere else where it is cited by the naked eye, provided you share the night, you can also celebrate Eid accordingly. Hazrat al Sistani says, no, it's not a global sighting, it's a local sighting. Both of these giants have got their evidence, detailed evidence. They scrutinize every hadith for its authenticity, for its credibility, for its veracity, for its demonstrative proof of what is it trying to say. And alhamdulillah, the detailed discussion of Marwa Khoi is available. The detailed discussions of Ayatla Sistani is available. It's rare, but unfortunately it's available about Eid. And now his son, Sayyid Muhammad Riza Sistani, may Allah protect our ulama, great scholar, is giving dars e kharij Detailed discussion, more than what his father has done on the case of Eid. When you have a cursory glance at both the evidence, you find Sheikh Arif's evidence is not convincing. Pause. Conclusion till now, I still got a little portion to conclude the next step, what we need, need to take. Overall, the impression this humble servant who was given this task to assemble and collect and clari seek clarification and verify the statements, this humble servant feels that whereas on other issues, maybe Sheikh Arif has spoken good things, but there are certain issues about aqaid, about pluralism, about the ilm ghayb of the ma'asum, about the status of the ma'asum, where he's off mainstream. 
the mainstream with powerful evidence, believes in it, and there is supporting evidence. Sheikh Arif is not mainstream on these issues. On the issue of the Quran and its applicability to our times, he is not. And the rest, inshallah, the details later on. To continue, uh, uh, before I continue, a quick uh, summary. So the mandate to uh, gather information and uh, investigate the reported statements that were in circulation, the mandate came from the secretariat who were receiving information and queries from the members of the public. And the process of meeting Sheikh Arif began in uh, December 2017, and uh, a second meeting took place in February 2018, where we started off by presenting the transcripts of the video clips that were in circulation. The problem with the transcripts, of course, was we uh, in the Islamic education uh, never um, uh, chose or selected or extracted it from his statement. Somebody else was doing it, circulating it, and we were given the task of inquiring. One of the main objections Sheikh Arif had against this process was that we were taking things out of context. So then we started the process of listening to the whole lectures, be it in the US, the UK, Australia, and elsewhere. And then we managed to get some more material. And also we managed to get some academic papers from him, from the public domain that he had posted on his website and on his personal website. Um, and the process took long because there was a lot of time in, in obtaining and procuring the necessary uh, documents. So finally in October, uh, what we did was to categorize the, the information we had gathered into different areas. One was the area of Aqaid, another one was of history, another one was of Quran, the other one was Fiqh, and usul -e fiqh And in order to be fair, because what we did, the amount of material collected was huge. Obviously, we had to select, extract, summarize, paraphrase. So what we did was, in order for fairness, we sent a copy of this dossier to Sheikh Arif for him to uh, review and tell us that, yes, we have accurately uh, reflected his views before we take the next step now of investigating and and getting guidance from the top experts in the field. Um, unfortunately, uh, Sheikh Arif's response to our dossier, which was sent by the Secretariat, was that there were some uh, misrepresentations of his statements in our dossier. So then we requested, okay, we are human beings. Maybe our perception, our interpretation may have been a little mistaken. So please show us where have we gone wrong. And we sent that request. And just about a day before uh, we came to the conference, a letter came from Sheikh Arif addressed to uh, Pramukh Saib. Uh, Al-Hajj Anwar by the Ramsi, but also a copy was sent to us, the Islamic education, where he was, he was questioning some of the processes th that were in place and how come we didn't respond and uh, some questions about um, the inaccuracies or the misrepresentations of his statements. And he gave us a few examples. So we will need to go into those details afterwards and continue uh, discussing with him. But I would like to uh, point out certain basics. In the area of aqaid and pluralism and il ghaib and ismat and tawassul, our understanding at the Islamic education is that Sheikh Arif's views are not mainstream. And we have obviously the, the evidence uh, for it. In the area of uh, 
so for example, pluralism, if I can just give you a little uh, contextual background, the whole idea of pluralism was, was developed and presented in Europe. Europe, you must remember, 17th, 18th century was full of wars between the princes out there. And they discovered the reason was intolerance, not accepting the other side, thinking that you are only right and the other side is wrong. In order to facilitate tolerance, they came up with this idea of pluralism where we said, they said that the other side could also be right, so let's respect them. And this concept was then uh, imported to the Islamic world, first to the Sunni world, and then it came to the Shia world, first to the Arabic Sunni world, and then the, uh, the Shia Farsi speaking world. And alhamdulillah, our scholars have responded to it, uh, those, who have been, uh, those who have faced these challenges, for example, uh, in Iran. The issue of the Quran's historicity, that the Quran was a text that was revealed 7th century Arabia and addresses the problems of that time. This concept of historicity, again, Orientalists, first of all, raised it against Muslims. For example, Golzihar and Shacht, and then Typically, some enlightened Muslim uh, thinkers, they read the Western objections against Islam and they took it up. So in the uh, Farsi-speaking Shia world, we have Dr. Abdul Karim Surush, who espouses this idea of uh, historicity. This was in the past. Of course, he has now advanced beyond that. In the Sunni Arabic-speaking world, Nasir uh, Hamid Abu Zaid, propose this idea of the hit historicity. And scholars in the Sunni world, in the Shia world, have responded to these objections. Sheikh Arif presents a whole new paradigm and framework of thinking for fiqhi masail, the theory which he calls the theory of form and essence, that the deen has an essence which is fixed, unchanging, immutable. And then there are forms and appearances and context based on the context where the laws change over time from the time of Prophet Ibrahim to Musa alayhi salam to Isa to the last prophet and beyond. This theory of form and essence, again, it may be new to us, but already the scholars in our Hausa have already been exposed to it and they have responded to it and they've not accepted it. Again, there are academic uh, arguments for not accepting it. They accept it partially with specific limitations and conditions. Sheikh Arif raises this issue where it's his favorite issue in several Muharram Majlises. He talks about apostasy, for example, that the punishment for apostasy does not appear in the Quran. Again, it's not a new issue. It's been there already in the Farsi, Arabic, Shia academic circles, and our ulama have responded, including, incidentally, Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah protect our maraja, his son, uh, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir Sistani. He's also a great scholar, a teacher in, in, in Najaf. One of the students there uh, uh, guided me to his work, and he, has, and he has responded to this objection of apostasy. The issue of Hilal, I've already indicated. Sayyid Muhammad Riza Sistani has discussed about this extensively. The his issue of history, do you notice that when we sat with Sheikh Arif, we said, but you say that Arba'in, the caravan did not come back in the first year, and we said no, but there are other histo history scholars who say no, there's enough evidence to show that it did come back in the first year, and he said he was not aware of it. And finally, interestingly, he, he claims he has got the ijazah of ijtihad from one scholar in Iran by the name of uh, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir, uh, sorry, Sayyid Muhammad, I'm forgetting his name, sorry? Oh, Dama yes, Sayyid Mustafa Muhaqqiq Damad, a scholar in his own right, studied in the Hausa, he's now based in the universities in, in Tehran, uh, recognized academician there, Interestingly, I found that Sheikh Arif is not even aware of some of the thinking of Sayyid Mustafa uh, Muhaqqid Damad. For example, 
In one of his majlises, Sheikh Arif speaks about interest, contextual interest was uh, some types of interest can be acceptable, some not acceptable. There's one Ayatollah in Iran by the name of Ayatollah uh, Sani'i, Sheikh Yusuf Sani'i. He has come up with this concept of interest that you can have uh, interest for, uh, for personal use and interest for, let's say, industrial or business development. He, he, he accepts the interest for business development, doesn't accept it for personal loans. Uh, interestingly, Sayyid Muhaqiq Damad has got a 70-page discussion rebutting and criticizing Ayatollah Sheikh Yusuf Sani'i's views about interest, some interest allowed, some interest not allowed. It seems Sheikh Arif is not even aware of what his own ustad who has given him the ijazah of ijtihad has spoken about interest. So I'm beginning to discover in areas of history, in areas of fiqh, in areas of usul of fiqh, in areas of Quran, in areas of pluralism and aqaid, he seems to be taking a view, an interpretation, a perception which is not supported by the majority. He's not, either he's not aware or he's ignoring, but if you are a true mushtad, you need to be able to respond to the current thinking, the alternative argument, and raise it, criticize it, respond to it, and then say, this is my particular view, which unfortunately we have not seen in his works. So conclusion is, of course, I'm not claiming I'm the top scholar in this field. The field is vast. For example, he's, he's got about 20 fiqhi masail that he has raised which are controversial. Each of these masail needs days and hours and maybe weeks and months of investigation to be able to find out what is the current top thinking in that field. So my, my concluding statement is, Sheikh Arif is a respectable person. We, we've got no personal uh, enmity. We are very cordial. We had a very respectful meeting, uh, cordial exchange. Uh, but, there, but there are academic differences, the differences of views, and views are based on perception, on, on evidence, on proof, on what you're convinced about, what are your principles of thinking. I would suggest to the honorable counselors here, the Secretariat, Pramukh Sahib, that these views, they need to be, because all of this is in English, and it's just recently in the past couple of weeks, we've managed to bring it to this level. It took us a lot of time to gather. So allow us to get it translated into the language of the Hausa in Arabic, in Farsi. Present and consult with the top experts in the field who have already done work on this years ago. And seek their guidance of how to be able to respond to this. But the minimum is he is off mainstream the way I have understood. Uh, his thinking so far. Um, Alhamdulillah, uh, Satter Bai uh, is a witness. Recently in this trip of Hajj in 1439, we incidentally uh, bumped into one great uh, alim uh, in Hajj and uh, we were just uh, inquiring that we are facing challenges in our community, there are alternative thinking and thoughts being presented. I was very much impressed, and Sabdar Bai also is here. This Ayatollah, he's a scholar, he gives the Kharij, he's based in Qom, he's done extensive research. He says, uh, I would like to meet this scholar of your community. And uh, I, I, I've done 50 years of research. I'm not saying I, what I know is 100% true. Maybe there's some things may not be true. Let me meet this alim of your community. Let me listen to him. Let him try to convince me. Maybe I may change my mind. And I said, thank you very much. You, you, you are very open-minded and receptive and welcoming to, to, to discussion, to debate. Sheikh Arif, on several occasions, he is challenging. He says, I challenge all the scholars and I challenge all the fuqaha. This, for example, the issue of Eid. Well, now we have a humble request that we can, uh, we can prepare his thinking, translate it into Farsi or Arabic, present it to the top scholars, and then invite Sheikh Arif, come in, come and discuss with the top experts uh, in the field, and, and uh, prove your point. They're open-minded, they'll perhaps change their minds uh, when they listen to your, to your evidence. But so far, to us, it has not been convincing. Like I said, I respect the man, 
very humble, very friendly, cheerful. He's got good ideas in many fields, but there are some areas where he seems to have taken a position which are not acceptable by mainstream. Let's pray to guidance. We have a beautiful dua which we are taught in uh, dua of uh, iftitah by Imam Zaman, which we recite in the month of Ramadan, which is that, oh Allah, there will be differences. But oh Allah, give us the inspiration, the guidance to be able to identify what is right and wrong when there is a difference of opinion. Let's pray to Allah for tawfiq. And we'll be glad to hear the input from the honorable counselors. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.